Hello, welcome to Fast Physics. So today we're going to look at force fields and what gravitational fields are. So a force field is quite literally just a region where objects experience a non-contact force. So you don't have to be touching in order for them to experience a force. Now, force fields cause those interactions between objects. So for instance, if you've got a negative charge, it will move towards a positive charge. That is due to a force. Gravity. Um, is because of the gravitational field, it causes objects to be attracted to each other due to their masses. So any object with a mass will experience an attractive force. Now that is the main thing that we need to make very, very clear with gravitational fields is it is purely an attractive force. And that only happens if an object has mass. So for instance, a photon will not experience a gravitational force because it doesn't have a mass. Only objects with a really, really large mass such as the earth or the sun or the moon actually have a noticeable effect on something else so um you know a human in space is not going to be able to pull something like the size of the sun or the earth all the way over towards it but the earth will pull it towards them you know it's it's the main cause of fields and tides on earth so the, the moon causes tides on earth due to this gravitational force field so in terms of gravitational fields, they are vectors. Now, a vector, as you hopefully should know by now, has a magnitude, so how big it is, and a direction. And that is really important. We have to identify the direction in which they're moving by representing it with arrows. Now, where those lines are, or lines of force, so if it, it's easy for you to remember it's lines of force, where those lines of force are very, very close together, it means the field is strong, kind of similar to contour lines on a map. So where the contour lines are close together, the mountain is very steep. Uh, if the lines are close together on um, a field diagram like this, it means that it is very strong. So uh, if they're further apart, it means it is weaker. So for instance, if I was to put that like that, here the field is very strong, while here the field is quite weak. Now, on Earth, um, the field is almost uniform, which means because it's pretty much flat um, in most most places on Earth, we consider it a um, even even object all the way around. Because it's almost like that, we consider it to be almost uniform. So that means the lines are parallel and they're equally spaced apart. Now, as well as that, we have to consider that the Earth's gravitational field is radial. So if we were to draw the lines going all the way through, they should cross over in the center. So. So they all point to the centre of the object because it's a uniform object, as I've already mentioned. Distances have a huge effect on the force of a vector, which is a gravitational field. So, you know, the distance between those objects depends on the masses involved. And it's quite easy to work out due to most planets being circular or most objects we're considering in space to be circular. Obviously, things like... Um, Meteors are not necessarily uh, spherical in shape, but we consider planets to be. So because of that, uh, they all the mass we consider is concentrated at the very centre of the objects. Objects behave like this because they are uniform spheres. So we can put these um, numbers into Newton's law of gravitation. Now, what this is, is the force of the objects that they experience. So that's obviously in Newtons, is equal to the mass of object one. So we'll call this M1 times by the mass of object two. So we'll call this M2. And then that's divided by um, the radius between them, squared. And that's from the centre of the object to the centre of the other object. 
So that's R. And you also need to make sure that you times it by the gravitational constant, which is a big G. So big G is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared by kilograms to the minus two. Now, this is, as I said, constant. It doesn't matter what planets we're talking about. It will always remain the same. So normally, we I've explained that in a different order because I was trying to explain it in terms of the diagram. But generally, we see this equation written like this. Which obviously means exactly the same thing. I've just written it in order to make it link to this. Now, um... This obviously shows that the force that you're experiencing is dependent on the size and the masses of these two. And it also depends on the distance between them. And we're times that by a constant. So, you know, this overall um, can work between any planets, any stars. So it's, it's pretty versatile in terms of what you can use it for. Now, this law of gravitation is otherwise known as an inverse square law. So if you're really stuck in an exam and it asks you what is Newton's law of gravitation, you can always say it's an inverse square law, okay? I'm going to put a great big fat star next to that because that's really, really important. And that basically means that for our force to alter, it's dependent on the radius squared. So inverse all the way around, square, because that's square and it's a law because it's Newton's law of gravitation. So, um, you know, that is proportional to my 1 over my r square. So if the distance of r increases, then my force is going to decrease. Oops. So if R increases, F will decrease. And another way of thinking about it is if the distance doubles, then the force is going to be a quarter of what it was before. So F is a quarter of what it was. So, you know, if you're trying to estimate gravitational force between objects, you can also use this law if you don't have any numbers per se. So sometimes your one mark questions use this knowledge of the inverse square law to expect you to answer questions without numerical values. Now, a lot of you are probably sitting there thinking, well, in school, I was taught that uh, gravity is 9.81. I wasn't taught that it's this 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 number. Now that's because we were talking before about the force, so the force due to gravity. Now we're talking about the field strength due to gravity. So the gravitational field strength is the force per unit mass. So on every single planet, every single moon, every single star, um, your field strength is going to be different. The field that you're experiencing is going to be different. Now, it does depend on where you are in the field. This G can also be defined as the acceleration of a mass in a field. So we also know it as the acceleration due to gravity. So if we're talking about a person parachuting, he has a field strength of 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Or you can say he's got an acceleration due to gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. Now, when you think about this, because of the inverse square law, if you're further away from the center of an object, your force is going to get smaller. Now, due to that, if you're on the top of Everest, your mass obviously is going to stay constant, but the force you're experiencing is going to be changing. So your weight changes at the top of Everest compared to if you're at the bottom. Um, so your G is your constant your planet will be experiencing if you're all sat at the same area. However, if you're changing your place relative to the center of that planet or the center of that moon, that G is going to be changing. So you just need to be aware that on Earth, G is 9.81, and that's your force per unit mass. This is the equation you can use, and this is how it can otherwise be defined as. So one last little thing you need to be aware of is this graph here. So as I mentioned before, if you're at the top of Everest, you're therefore going to be experiencing a completely different weight. Now, this is because G, so your gravitational field strength, is proportional to your R squared. Now, looking at this graph here, 
RE is the radius of the Earth. So if I draw a bright pink Earth, this is the centre. If this is my RE, my radius of the Earth, that's when I'm at the surface of the Earth. Before that, I'm not at the surface yet, so I'm not experiencing a maximum G. So it will be doing... It'll be doing that. So once you hit the radius of the Earth, as you're going further and further and further away, it's going to decrease in your gravitational field. Now, that is because here, you're getting more and more and more mass underneath the object that you could be attracted to. So here, as I'm moving further and further away, there's more mass underneath. Once you get to this point and you start moving away, you're not getting any more mass underneath you, so therefore your gravitational field strength is going to be affected because your mass is now staying the same. So when we talk about this, you have another equation for G that you can use, which is the following. So big G is your 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, M is your mass of your object. So in this case, your Earth. And your R is your radius from the centre. So G has now been calculated in two ways. So little g has been calculated in two ways. You've got that way of doing it, and you also got this way. And then obviously your F can be found using So these three equations can all link together to help you find out your answers. Bye.